Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our fourth virtual talk series celebrating the biodiversity of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. In a second, I'm going to pass over to Emily Millhouse of Frog Life um, for a talk about amphibians. We'll be on for about an hour to an hour and 20, and feel free to add questions in the Q&A. If you need help with captions, there's an option to put caption on your screen. And finally, I'd like to thank the Friends of Holland Park for their sponsorship. So without further ado, um, welcome Emily, and thanks very much for joining us. That's right, thank you very much for that, Trevor. Um, hello to everyone who's joining us. I will move on just to introduce myself and uh, Frog Life in general, if you haven't heard of us before. Um, so my name's Emily, I run the London Toad project, which is primarily focusing on the common toad um, in sort of the London area, looking across all the boroughs. So the reason why we're focused slightly more on one species um, in the southeast of the UK is because it's an area where the common toads are declining at the steepest rate. So I'll get a really horrible stat out the way now so I don't have to address it later with cute photos of toads. But the reason for our project being based around toads is we've lost 68% of our common toads in the UK in the past 30 years. To give you a more realistic idea or grasp of how many that is or how many are dying each year, it's about 20 tonnes a year that are found dead on British roads and that's just during their migration period. So that's just giving you a bit of scale of sort of my background and where my interests lie based at Frog Life. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about what Frog Life is. So uh, we're a, a national wildlife conservation charity. We can serve our lovely amphibians and our reptiles and the habitats that, that they use really and that they depend on. So we do everything from um, transforming landscapes. So we do lots and lots of pond building or pond restoration, terrestrial building, restoration there. We work a lot of people, um, so all of our projects engage as wide a, a reach of people as possible um, to get involved in conservation, particularly around these animals. And then the third element is that looking into our research. Um, so we work a lot globally with amphibian conservation organisations, looking into disease and other sort of amphibian and reptile conservation issues. So lots of it due to decline or, or lack of um, sort of habitats or things like that. There's one other element. Um, to sort of Frog Life, we have a trading arm, so Frog Life Limited. Um, that's the company that's attached to the charity. Um, so they're the ones that anyone can get in touch with. So if you want training courses, specifics, kind of like this, or going even more in depth from sort of our introduction courses um, into any of our species, including Great Crested Newt Licensing. If you want big habitat works on any sort of privately owned sites or any surveying work. So that's kind of what that half, that half does. But without further ado, we'll kick off with the fun stuff. So today we're going to be talking about our lovely UK amphibians. We'll have a few moments talking about a couple of the uh, naughty amphibians that are non-natives and we, we hope to never find, but unfortunately we do, particularly for all of us joining uh, in this talk that are from London. And um, there's a few of these you will, you will sometimes spot in London's ponds. So we will kick off with the natives. We have seven native amphibians in the UK. We have our anurans or frogs and toads at the top. So we have our common frog on the top left, our common toad in the middle and the natterjack toad in the top right. Then we follow this up with our newts or salamanders. So we have our smooth newt on the left, the great crested newt on the right hand side and the palmate newt in the middle. And I did say seven and we also have the pool frog. Now the pool frog gets its own little cool uh, slide animation because Although it is a native British amphibian, um, it did actually go extinct in the early 1900s in the UK. A lot of it due to loss of ponds. We've had a drastic decrease in the amount of ponds we have in the UK, sort of across all different landscapes. Um, and also the introduction of a few non-natives that have pushed it out. I'll address that a bit later, but they still get a little note in here because we have one successful reintroduction site of pool frogs in the UK, and that's in the north, the north of north, Norfolk. Um, so in that area, you will now find pool frogs there and doing doing quite well. And they're starting to spread back their sort of natural range as people are managing those ponds and landscapes specifically for them. So uh, we'll talk a bit more about that. We will kick off with the the big one, the most common of all common and the one that uh, is our namesake at our charity, uh, the common frog. So we'll talk a little bit about the idea of this. And there's a few things that makes a common frog a common frog. So one of the key things is when we look at their skin. Um, so common frogs have this lovely sort of smooth skin. So you can see across their backs, there are no obvious sort of bumps or sort of uh, undulations on their skin whatsoever. It's fairly smooth and almost wet looking um, in the way of its appearance. 
they do have quite a sort of stark range of camouflage patterns. So you will find there'll be a lot more sort of spots or variation you find on frogs in the UK rather than toads. Um, so the key thing that we look for there is that sort of smooth skin that can come in a variety of different colours. One of the other things um, we look for specifically in a common frog is that lovely dark eye patch. So you can see just behind the large eyes of the frogs here, um, you can see they've got this sort of dark, almost a mask, shall we say, just behind their eyes. I know uh, some of the school children that my team works with, they call it a superhero mask. That is a specific identification feature of common frogs and common frogs only. Uh, you don't find that on pool frogs. You don't find that on the non-native frogs that you possibly will come in contact with within London. So that's one of the key things you're looking for. Also super useful um, for when you look into a pond earlier on in the year. So if you're looking in springtime uh, where you get lots of the adults in there for mating, you'll tend to find you only really see the top part, the frog's head sticking out of the water. And if you're already seeing that dark mask there, then you know straight off the bat, it's a frog that you're looking at and not a toad. And you also know it's a common frog you're seeing. So this is certainly one of the most useful features that we have. The other sort of key feature that we look for in our frogs are these lovely long back legs. So particularly the photo on the right, so the lovely green frog that we have, you can see the legs there are folded over twice. So a frog's back legs are generally uh, longer than the length of the rest of their body. So from their nose to their basically their hips tends to be a little bit shorter in length compared to their entire legs. And that's pretty much to facilitate the way they get away from predators. So common frogs are your, your speedy ones. They're the ones that are going to be jumping away really, really quickly um, whenever you disturb any form of grass or any form of habitat nearby. So if it's moving very quickly, then you know it's a frog you're looking at, whereas if it's moving a lot slower, it tends to be a toad. The other thing we point out there is the striped back legs. So all frog species across across Europe, apart from the tree frogs, will always have stripy back legs. That's something you'll only ever find on frogs as opposed to toads. Toads won't have any sort of markation that's different from the rest of their body on the backs of their legs. Um, so very much you can remember it as a go faster stripes if they're hopping away very quickly um, and you can see any stripes on their back legs then you definitely know it's a frog that you're that you're spying on. The other thing with our common frog um, and this is going to become more important particularly if you visit places like um, the wet London Wetland Centre in Barnes uh, you may find marsh frogs there but one really important difference as well when you see them if you ever see these frogs calling uh, our common frog just has one vocal sac on sort of the base of its head so it's one sac that inflates tends to be the males that tend to make these sort of calls and that will inflate singular one singular sac there whereas marsh frogs which you may see you'll see that they inflate at both sides so it's a little bit different um, from the way as well when you when you see them so we'll look a bit more at their color um so i always think color is a really important thing to to talk about when it comes to frogs um because there is such a wide range even here in the uk all of these here are common frogs and I think particularly the important ones to look at are the two on the right hand side. Um, of course, they both look quite red and red generally isn't a sort of colour that we think of when we think uh, common frogs. But they're still the key features that we look for. So we still know, even though it's an almost entirely red frog, particularly the bottom right corner, uh, they've still got that lovely dark eye mask that you're looking for and they still have those stripy back legs. Now, there is a disease. We will have a, a little uh, horrible zone right at the end where we'll look at diseases in a uh, frogs and toads and, and other amphibians. But one of the things just to mention is there's one of disease called ranavirus, um, and generally that's known as red leg. So even if the frog is entirely red like that, it doesn't necessarily mean it's got ranavirus. Ranavirus is unfortunately, it's, it's really sad to say, but it's quite obvious when a frog has ranavirus, you'll see these large sort of lesions or blisters across its body and it, it just truly looks um, unwell. So if it's a, an entirely red frog going about its business, it's probably absolutely fine. Whereas if it's quite a lethargic frog with large blisters or just reddening of certain areas, then you know you should be getting in touch with us or um, Garden Wildlife Health to investigate if that's a disease we're looking for. But yeah, they come in a whole host of different colours and markings, um, which does, does certainly make them pretty stunning. We'll go on to our next species. This is the one uh, I've already preempted. I'm very biased towards a common toad. I spend all of my time talking about common toads. Um, so the common toad here, you can see they've got that sort of rougher warty skin and there is a reason for the skin being warty um, i know there's the old wives tales if you if you pick a toad up or you touch a toad you yourself will get warts that isn't the case but there is a reason for why they have warty skin so 
If you just look just behind the eyes of the slightly reddish toad on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see there are two very large sort of warts or bumps just behind their eyes. Those there are called paratoid glands. So the paratoid glands, they secrete a toxin all over the toad's back um, and that toxin is called bufotoxin. And as to us or any other mammal, it would essentially taste like acetone or nail polish remover. Um, so that's what stops any predators from eating them. And that's their main way of stopping, yeah, stopping predators full stop, really. Um, but that's one of the key reasons why their skin's not smooth. Because of course, if they rely on secreting this toxin, the last thing they want is it to run off or wash off very quickly. So all of those bumps basically just hold that liquid on their back for as long a time as possible. Now, I'll be honest, that doesn't completely stop all predators. Uh, I have seen in the past, you get the, the occasional very cunning fox, which learns um, that picking up a toad is, is pretty horrible and you don't want to do it. Uh, they learn to flip them over onto their backs. And sometimes you'll find some, some sort of toad populations um, get completely eaten by a fox who's learnt, flip them over and just eat their tummies and the underside of their bodies. That's probably, I know the, the site I used to work on that had that occur. It's quite a horrible thing to turn up to just loads of skins of toads. Um, but generally that is a natural predator that has done that. Tends to be cats don't necessarily think about that as a strategy. They have the one hit of going, oh, that tastes bad and spits them straight back out. Obviously, that is a great way to stop predators from eating you um, by tasting so bad and having these toxins. It has caused this decline I spoke about earlier um, because as sort of particularly for all of us based in London, as developments have occurred, we've got more and more roads interjecting the routes where lots of our animals move around and migrate. Toads are one of our sort of longest migration sort of species when it comes to amphibians. A common toad can easily walk up to three kilometres in springtime uh, when they come out of their hibernation area back to their breeding pond. Now, the problem there lies is there's many roads they're going to meet when that occurs. Now, when they get scared or they feel anxious that anything's going to harm them or hurt them or eat them, the thing they do is they'll stay perfectly still. They'll try and flatten out a little bit if possible on whatever ground there is and taste really bad. With us in our cars, that's what's causing that sort of 20 tonne mortality each year is they're just not moving out the way. Whereas frogs, when they get startled by the lights or any of the noises, they'll just try and move. They'll just try and get out of the way for that. So it is very much a, a man-made issue, um, that specific one when it comes to mortality on roads for toads. But there is hope. Um, so our charity for the past 40 years has been running a project called Toads on Roads. Um, it's the one where you may have seen it every so often. Uh, it comes up on Country File and things like that. Um, where we have toes on roads patrol uh, patrollers, our volunteers that go out, they wear little high vises, um, high vis jackets, and they have buckets, and they'll go collect all of these toads. They'll put them into buckets and move them across the road um, to allow them to get to these mating ponds without being squashed. It's an incredible effort. There's about 200 patrol groups across the UK, and to give you sort of a quantity of the amount those patrol groups are ten tend to be picking up, it's about 107,000 toads. They collect in that sort of springtime period and they just move them all across to get them to safety. Now, you may ask, why does that occur more with toads? Not just the fact that they stay still. Um, they're a lot more specific when toads when it comes to where they want to when they want to breed. Toads are hereditary. They tend to go back to the exact same pond they were born in or spent their time as tadpoles in. So they'll make that journey back and forth throughout their life um, to mate there, whereas frogs uh, frogs at times can be wonderful that you build a pond and they'll turn up or it can do the other thing where you've spent ages, um, loads and loads of labour building a wonderful pond for them. Then there's a little puddle because it's been a wet day and the females thought, well, there will do and she'll lay her spawn. So pretty much any body of water frogs are happy with, whereas toads are very specific in what they're looking for. They're going back to that same spot or anything directly on that line. Um, which is one of the reasons why they're one of our target species uh, to look at. The other thing which makes them slightly more likely to have a higher mortality is actually the, the lifespan. Um, so I'll just give you like 10 seconds in your head to think about how old you think a frog would live to and how old you think a toad would live to. So just in your head, visualise what, what you think a reasonable number is for those species to get to. I think this is long enough. Um, so a common frog um, can live up to 12 to 14 years of its life. So quite happily for those years, moving back and forth um, from the ponds to breed. Common toad, basically double that, can live up to 30 years old in the wild, um, which is a stark difference. 
So these also tend to be the animals people find in their gardens, under sheds. They spend a lot of time um, just consuming pests in the garden, which is great. They eat the highest quantity of slugs of any of our species that I'm talking about today. So they are very much the ones you want. And it also tends to be when you get the very, very large toads. So the large females that are up to about 13 centimetres, sort of when they're stretched out, otherwise sort of this kind of size. Um, that tends to be if they've had a bad breeding year or they've been injured in any way, they tend not to bother going back to the ponds at all and they'll stay in a garden and just consume all year round. But yeah, less, less about that and we'll continue on about what, what our ID features are for the common toad. So the other thing, we already spoke about how they stop predators from getting them. They move slowly um, and they taste bad. So they have these really sort of short and stumpy back legs. So you can see they're generally just walking everywhere as they're going and they completely lack any form of coloration or dark patch behind the eye, which again is just really useful for us when you look into a pond um, and you're just seeing the top part of their heads. If it hasn't got that sort of patch, then you know it's a common toad that you're looking for. Another good thing to, to note or be aware of when it comes to toads um, is all toads will have a golden eye. Um, so frogs, they vary a little bit through the brown, sometimes slightly more reddish coloured eyes, whereas toads will always have sort of a vibrant golden eye. Um, a previous member of staff at Frog Life always used to call them the James Bond of the pond um, because they will always have a lovely vibrant golden eye. We'll talk a little bit about the pool frog. Um, again, this is, a, this is not a frog I expect for us to find um, in London at all, um, but this is the species that did go extinct and then has had a successful reintroduction and hopefully over time we'll start to see their population grow to a, a more stable level. So some of the key differences we're looking at here compared to um, the, the common frog that we looked at. So those vocal sacs, again, just like what we'd expect to see in the marsh frog, which is the frog you'd likely see in London with this, they have the dual vocal sacs, which come out towards the sides, as you can see in that top right photo. They also have that lovely dorsal stripe that runs straight down their back. So that's something only they have. You don't find that at all on the, uh, the common toad or the common frog. And then the other thing you can see is they have these sort of ridges. So almost down the edges of its back, you can see there's two sort of fine ridges along there. Um, and that's one of the other things you're, you're looking for. One of the reasons why pool frogs uh, didn't do too good in the UK um, was the Victorians had it in their head for a while. Um, but as the French were eating frogs, so the French would eat the edible frogs, um, they thought, oh, well, in the UK, they'll do the same. Uh, they actually imported a lot of marsh frogs to the UK because when you mate a marsh frog with a pool frog, um, you get a sort of a sterile hybrid, which is the edible frog, which is what people consume elsewhere in the world. Uh, they thought this would take off, um, it didn't. And then they had thousands of marsh frogs um, in big sort of uh, frog farms, particularly along the Kent coast, so down towards Rye Harbour. They didn't know what to do with them. So in sort of the early 1900s, lots of those cages, they were just lifted and they released lots of those uh, yeah, those uh, captive marsh frogs into the wild. To give you a quick bit of perspective on size, uh, a pool frog, if you look at your fist, is about half the size of your fist, so it's quite a small frog, whereas a marsh frog can quite happily get to the same size as my head. So significantly uh, different size species, um, which of course, when you put them in the same pond competition, there's no chance for the pool frog to keep up, particularly where uh, marsh frogs, it's pretty much, if it fits in their mouth, uh, they will consume it. So whether that be other marsh frogs that are smaller, uh, pool frogs or anything, they'll consume it. So we'll talk again, just to, we'll briefly have a look at the Natterjack toad. So the Natterjack toad, again, isn't isn't a species I'd expect to find, uh, particularly not in, in central London um, at all. Um, we tend to find these when we go in towards sort of Surrey or down towards the um, sort of southwest of the UK. So you tend to find them in very sort of sandy areas, um, so onto sand dunes and, and those kind of spaces. But also if you ever go down to Dorset um, or down in towards Cornwall, you may find every so often if you're walking along a beach side, you may find there's ponds and they're completely fenced in. These tend to be Natterjack toad ponds um, and they're fenced in just to stop, you know, dogs or any other sort of animals being allowed in. Um, to disturb these habitats because again they're a species that isn't doing too well quite often due to lack of habitats that are still here. Um, just the exact same as the common toad, they have that sort of lovely rough warty skin, they do the same thing to stop predators, they create a toxin which tastes really bad, 
they kind of like the pool frog, they have this sort of dorsal stripe that runs straight down their back. So another key way you can tell it's not a common frog that you're looking at. And they also have quite a mottled colour. Um, the photo on the bottom right is actually a really good example for this. Um, they're very sort of patchworky in the way that they the way that they look. They look a lot closer to some of the species if you if you travel abroad to anywhere in America. Most of their toes tend to have a lot more sort of patchy, patchy looking skin um, compared to our sort of common toe that you find in your gardens. So we'll go back a bit in their uh, their lifespan and um, we'll have a look at the differences even at the point of uh, of being laid. So we have frog spawn in the top left there. Um, so you can see that sort of these large jelly mats or clumps that are left on sort of the surface of the pond. Um, I know for sure from from visiting Trevor and uh, uh, Holland Park many times um, you get a lot of this <laughs> and it's sort of you'll find the whole areas of ponds um, just completely covered with it, particularly as frogs come along and they layer on pond layer. A female frog will quite happily lay between 2,000 and 3,000 eggs in springtime, um, so she's very busy. The, the quantity is purely to allow for sort of predation, again, that kind of safety in numbers. To give you a really good perspective, um, out of those sort of two to 3,000 eggs, it's about 0.114% that will actually make it to being an adult frog. So it's quite a small percentage that do make it all the way through. Whereas toad spawn is on the top right here, so common toad spawn is in these lovely sort of rows of two by two, and a common a female common toad will probably only lay about two to three hundred eggs, so a significantly uh, smaller amount than the frogs do, and she tends to be a lot more secretive with where she lays these. Uh, she'll lay these at the bottom of the pond, and she'll twine sort of intertwine them around all of the vegetation there, so she pretty much keeps them pretty hidden. Um, one of the reasons why she doesn't have to create as much spawn um, is that toxin we spoke about that gets secreted on the backs of common toads, that's already present um, in their sort of spawn. Um, so it means they're basically inedible to many different predators within the pond. That also goes as far as to fish. So it's common toads are the only, to uh, the only amphibian that we have in the UK that quite happily will spawn um, in sort of angling lakes or alongside any form of other other fish um, because the fish already at that point know they don't taste good um, so they don't predate on it whereas fish will completely decimate all of your sort of frog or newt, newt spawn um, and eggs so it's quite a clear difference at spawn um, sort of uh, the spawn and what it looks like for the common frog and common toad and when we look at the lower half of this slide, uh, you'll see the tadpoles. The tadpoles as well are uh, quite different. So common frogs always tend to be a sort of brown and they have this lovely sort of gold speckling across their body. Um, so you'll see them quite often. You'll find them in very, very small amounts or sometimes even singularly. And they'll just be al along the top of the surface of the of the water where they're sort of gaining all the heat, basically all the energy. Um, and then they'll just go around consuming as much as they possibly can within the pond. Uh, whereas common toads have a, I think, and again, I suppose I'm a little bit biased, um, I think have one of the sort of the coolest sort of behaviours when they're in sort of tadpole um, stage is they shoal. So just like fish do, or if you think, particularly I think in London, if you think about starlings and the way they do their sort of murmurations in the sky, um, common toads do this, they're tadpoles. So you'll get sort of a few hundred um, common toad tadpoles and they'll all move in big sort of swathes around the pond. And it's a really, really good way to be able to identify them as separate from frogs. Frogs don't work as a massive unit. Uh, there'll still be a few in there, but they'll all be very independent doing their own things. Whereas toads, they'll move throughout the entire pond altogether. And it is quite an incredible sight to see. The other way you can tell the difference is, um, you can see here, actually it's quite a good photo for it. Uh, the common toad tadpoles are almost entirely jet black. Um, they're also a little bit more sort of boxy looking. Um, they tend to be slightly more square in shape. Um, but that's a lot harder to see unless you maybe let's say you've been pond dipping and you've, you've caught one and you can physically see the difference. You'll see what I mean by by boxy. Um, but yeah, very much the behaviour helps um, to know if it's a, a common toad tadpole or a common frog tadpole. Unfortunately, this list rivals the list of the native frogs and toads we have in the UK. Um, we don't get reports of all of these often. There's a few that we do. Um, so things like the North American bullfrog, probably out of this entire list, um, the most lethal of all of the non-natives. Um, it quite happily breeds in, in UK ponds and will easily consume everything again due to size. 
Um, marsh frogs and a few of the others here, like midwife toads, you tend to find a bit more in the cities. Um, then a few of the others are, are scattered in very uh, strange populations. So I'll briefly talk about a couple of them. So the midwife toad, you do get very sort of uh, small populations of these about. Um, a good way of telling a midwife toad is actually listening to its call. Um, so you can check out on our website, there's a whole page that's just the sounds that all of these animals make. Uh, it's almost like an electronic beep, um, a midwife toad. So if you're walking through sort of a park or a pond, and the last record I had of a midwife toad was um, in Essex, um, which was, I think it was actually this season, um, we had a record of them. And it's just like a, it's almost like you've walked into an alarm of a very, very high pitched beeping noise. And that's midwife toads that you're hearing there. Um, they're quite small. Um, so again, you're looking at about nine centimetres or again, sort of if they're to sit upright, about three quarters of the size of your fist when you look down. We look to the top right, um, the marsh frog. This is the most sort of common non-native I do find um, in and around in London. You do find them across many different London ponds. Um, as I said, they can grow quite significant in size, about the same size as my head. They're incredibly green. Um, they will always be green. You're not going to find a sort of brown or red coloured marsh frog. They're always this very, very vibrant colour. They also have quite a, vib um, a sort of pointy nose. Um, and that's something you'll see on them as opposed to our native species tend to have a lot more rounded faces. Um, they also have, they have quite a sinister call. Um, again, it's a really good way to identify them. It's almost like a sort of duck's quack. So again, if you're near, if you're going out towards actually still the wetland centre, has quite a large population of marsh frogs or anywhere along the Lee Valley, or when you move down towards sort of Barkin and Dagenham, many different ponds and parks around there have populations of marsh frogs. Um, but yeah, they can be quite, quite sizable. The fire belly toad, um, we've not had records of them for a while. Um, it's a shame actually the way this photo looks, because it's actually their belly um, that shows them off. Um, you can kind of see parts of it there that's bright orange. Uh, it's a species that should be found across mainland Europe, um, just shouldn't be found here. Many of those released uh, from the pet trade. And then the bottom right, probably the, the strangest of all of our non-natives we have in the UK, the African clawed toad. Um, it eat, the clue is even in the name, but it's on the wrong continent. Um, the reason why we have African clawed toads in the UK is actually due to pregnancy testing. So just before sort of the, the 70s, when um, we had our sort of chemical pregnancy tests that we sort of traditionally use now, um, African clawed toads were brought from South Africa um, to the UK and held in labs. But if you expose a female African clawed toad to um, a woman who's pregnant's urine, uh, she will produce spawn. It won't be fertile, it won't be fertile spawn, um, but she will produce spawn and it was a surefire way of telling if someone was pregnant or not. Now, at that time, there wasn't the same regulations there are now about releasing non-natives into the wild or any form of captured species into the wild. They didn't know what to do with all these um, clawed toads, so they pretty much just released them. Most of these populations have been eradicated. Um, there's one population left um that's in sort of mid to south wales um it is monitored they are actively trying to get rid of them i think it was a little bit late their sort of approach to this uh, they didn't realize until 1993 that actually uh, lots of these toads they brought across from south africa actually had chytrid fungus so they are very much the uh, the fingers pointed at them as to why chytrid is present in the uk um and it's just through through many years of inaction, the population there has grown a little bit too large for them to handle straight off the back. But yeah, there's there's a lot out there online if you want to read more about the the weird circumstances as to how particularly whales ended up with African clawed toads in its ponds. Uh, another good thing, just I should always mention this now because I think it's a really key thing to when you're spotting um, particularly frogs and toads is all of the non-natives mate and you'll find them in the ponds later in the year. So you tend to find them late spring, early summer, and that's when they're in the ponds and mating and making their calls. Whereas all of our native species tend to be in a lot earlier. Um, so it's the frogs that tend to go first, um, which is sort of generally January, February. You get the odd errant common uh, frog, which goes nuts and uh, will lay spawn on like Boxing Day, which obviously is not OK, but <laughs> they're very much the earliest of all of them to spawn. 
then you'll get the common toads. Uh, they'll all pretty much spawn at the exact same time. There's about a two week lag in the UK that the first common toads to lay tend to be down in Cornwall. And in about two weeks time, you'll find the rest of the UK's toads will have caught up. They all move at the exact same time um, and they go back to their ponds and lay their spawn. And then they get back out and continue their business consuming things elsewhere. And then you're followed by the, uh, the nukes. So just to give you an idea that if you're finding it quite late in the season and you're seeing frogs or toads about, it is likely they're non-native if you're spotting them trying to breed. So we'll go into the next side of it. So the newts. We have our three species, the smooth newt, the palmate newt and the great crested newt. All three of these are present in London. Um, the least common of those three is the palmate newt, uh, mainly because the palmate newt prefers acidic ponds and we don't have many acidic ponds um, in London. You will find some. I'm not going to put that as a complete case. You get some places like Epping Forest, which has all three, um, but then Epping Forest does have about 200 ponds um, and they don't all occupy the exact same ones. Um, but very much the smooth newt and the great crested newts are the ones you will find in London. If you have a garden pond, uh, it is the smooth newt that will find it. You could build it um, and it can get sort of as little as a few days and that smooth newt somehow would have found your pond and they've moved in. Um, but it is likely that one that you're spotting. We do have two non-natives that can be encountered. Um, so the alpine newt and the Italian crested newt. Again, um, it tends to be the cities where we find the non-natives. Um, I haven't come across an Italian crested newt in quite a long time, um, but alpine newts we do come across every so often in ponds. We'll, again, we'll talk a bit more about, about the non-natives in a little while. So we'll talk first about the most common newt that we find. Um, so the smooth newt. They're a, a lovely little newt, so generally about their size is about the same size as your, uh, your index finger. So they're quite small. They're quite small newts, um, which is an important separation to remember, particularly with the males um, compared with the great crested newt, which we'll have a look at a photo of, um, because that's one of the com most common misidentified sort of species because the smooth newt still also gets a crest, um, but it's not it's not as as great as the great crested newt's crest. So the key things that we look for with the smooth newt is their yellow or orange underside. So their bellies are a lovely sort of vibrant orange or sometimes a slightly more muted yellow with black spots. Uh, the spots is really important um, because smooth newts have lovely circular spots. So you can see this photo of the male down in the bottom left and you can see all of his spots are pretty circular in the way they look. Whereas one of our other newt species you'll see is almost sort of splodges. They're not as, uh, not as coherent spots as these ones. Their, their chin also tends to have coloration spots on it. This is going to be incredibly important um, when you compare smooth newts to palmate newts. Um, so again, you're looking for that coloration all the way through the skin with spots there. If you spot that on them at all, you know it's a smooth newt that you're looking at. Now, um, as with many different species um, of, of, any, of any animal elsewhere in the world, uh, the males tend to be a lot prettier. Um, in the way that they, they make their appearance when it comes to sort of uh, mating time. So the male, like we've got on the bottom left here, he's quite brightly marked. Um, he gets this sort of beautiful, they tend to be very, very vibrant orange bellies. Um, they have very sort of fringed hind feet. This is a terrible photo to show it, but it's almost if you thought about if you had sort of a cheap plastic toy and sometimes when you find they heat seal them, you get that little sort of plastic fringe around the edge. That's exactly what happens to his his sort of back feet. He gets that there. Um, and so you'll see his lovely sort of feet that almost look feathery in appearance. And the really important thing that he gets that he's very obviously very, very proud of um, is that lovely smooth sort of crest. So his crest runs from the base of his head all the way down to his tail. Now it has no breaks whatsoever. So that's one crest that goes the entire length of his body. Again, that's an important ID feature compared with one of our other newt species. The males go through this whole sort of elaborate change in their appearance, mainly for their courtship. So in springtime, it's quite a cool thing that occurs in, in UK ponds when they've all moved in. So we're looking at about April time. Um, you get all the males appearing, they'll all be in their full attire, they'll go into the ponds looking for the females. If they find a female um, newt, they'll swim up to her, then they'll swim behind her, they'll nudge her cloaca, which is just at the back of her, her body between her back legs, and say to her, hey look I'm here, I want to mate with you. He'll then swim directly in front of her and he uses that large sort of crested tail 
and he just does these sort of lovely sort of swishing moments where essentially he's using his tail to flick and sort of swish all of his pheromones at the female's face. So he's just saying, hey, look, I'm here. I'm ready. I want to mate. I'm a good specimen. Choose me. If she's kind of interested, she'll face him. And at that point is when his belly comes into play. He'll then go vertically in the water and he'll do big swimming motions sort of vertically in the water, figures of eight. So he'll do figures of eight showing off his belly to her. And then if she's still quite interested, she'll tend to come a little bit closer. So he'll keep flicking that tail so she knows he's, uh, he's there. And then he tends to turn around and he'll lead her off to a more secluded part of the pond where he'll then go down to the bottom sort of the pond uh, floor and he'll lay one single spermatophore there, which she'll then lower herself over and that's their courtship done. It is incredibly elaborate and people uh, often don't think about our tiny little species like this doing so much um, to lay spawn. But it's, it's an incredible thing to see. There's quite a lot of videos um, on YouTube looking at these courtship displays if you are interested to see the, uh, the male smooth newt do all of his dancing. Um, yeah, it's an incredible thing to see. And if, if you have your own garden pond, I urge you next spring to go out and have a look with a torch in the evening and see if you can uh, you can spot any of this occurring. The females, um, they tend to be a lot sort of duller in their appearance. So they tend to be sort of more plain brown. So you can see the terrestrial newt just at the top there. She tends to stay like that, essentially. She'll stay very dark coloured um, and her, so all of her spots on her belly tend to be really, really small. Arguably, it's really important that she stays hidden, um, so she needs to not be as loud as the male. She doesn't want to be noticed. She wants to stay very close to the vegetation, be able to eat and lay spawn, um, whereas he needs to be seen to get his chance to mate. Um, so she has a very, very important job to do after this. So we'll go on to our next species. So this is the one I don't expect to find as often in London, uh, the palmate newt. So the palmate newt, um, has quite a yellowy belly. They don't, they don't really get to that vibrant orange at all. It tends to be yellow or slightly more muted yellow in sort of coloration. Their chin is completely sort of with no, no pigment. So almost completely pink in its appearance. So that top right photo shows you that really well. Uh, and again, a really important point to remember that smooth newts, which are the exact same size as palmate newts, would have spots going all the way up onto their chin. And it would definitely still have colour there. When we go down, you'll see that there's a, again, just like the other newts, you get sexual dimorphism. So you'll find that the males and females look a little bit different. Uh, so the males, which we've got on the left hand side, so those two photos, they get these sort of web tined feet. Uh, they almost look like clubs. That's really useful actually when we survey or if you look into a pond with a torch, um, because if you're seeing these sort of large sort of club like back legs, then you know it's a palmate newt that you're looking at from the top. And so it's a really, really handy ID feature for us. The other thing, when we look towards that bottom photo there of a the male, um, they get they don't have a crest at all. Um, so you'll see they completely lack that crest. And the only thing that changes is their tail. So their tail almost comes out like a sort of leaf shape. And then right at the end in that red circle, you'll find there's just a tiny little filament, which is the end of its tail. Um, so it almost stops. And then there's a tiny little bit just off the end. And that's a really, really good way to be able to tell the difference um, when you're looking in a pond. So if you're seeing that big sort of leaf shaped tail, then you know it's a, a palmate newt that you're looking for. The females, it gets a bit tougher um, to identify the females between each other. Um, one way is in this bottom right hand photo, you'll see very, very minute, but you'll see they have these little sort of white nodules on the back of their feet. Now, of course, that's quite an intrusive way to be able to tell if that's a palmate newt female or a smooth newt. To be, you'd have to pick her up, flip her over and check her back feet to check if she's a smooth or palmate. I would probably say um, the easiest way to tell if it's smooth newts or palmate newts, if you're just having a brief look in your pond and you wanna find out, if you find a female in there, particularly in springtime, just keep an eye on her because nine times out of 10, if there's a female in that pond, there will also be males. And the males are very obvious to tell the difference between. Um, they will be there if the females are there. Whereas if it is just the one newt that you're spotting, you're going to need to pick her up to have a good look to be able to check. Um, so that's just to give you a good idea of the difference when I'm talking about their spots. 
um, when it goes up and there's sort of coloration on their throats. So quite different um, when you're looking at the way they look from the underside. Again, it's a slightly more intrusive way to be able to check. But if you were out doing an actual sort of a survey for amphibians in ponds, this would be one of the things you'd, you'd want to do for a few of the individuals that you've dipped out or have found in your pond, just to make sure you know exactly what species you have. Now, of course, we go on to the the big boy, the great crested new, uh, the the figure species for many of our projects at Frog Life. So our previous London project was the London Dragon Finder. It is the dragon that we call in our sort of species group. Um, it is our largest newt species. So it's about the same length as my hand. So about double the size of the smooth or palmate newts when you're looking at them. The females particularly get quite large. Um, they can grow even longer and even sort of wider per se uh, as, as a section on my hand there. Um, yeah, they're a big little chunky newt to look at. They have a very, very vibrant sort of bright yellow or, or orange belly. Um, and again, it's when I use that term splodges, you'll find that on their belly you haven't got those per perfectly circular belly spots. Uh, it is very much just splodges across them. Um, I should actually add, they're, they're so useful to have those splodges because just like our fingerprints, um, those belly patterns are completely unique to each newt. Um, so if you had, let's say you had a pond and you wanted to monitor it each year, you could take the newts out, take photos of their bellies and track them over many years and see if it's the same newts you're finding each year or if you're getting a larger population and there's been any changes. And that's one of the things that we would do when we're out looking or, or looking at any of the ponds that we're working on. One of the other um, things to mention with these guys is, is their sort of rough or warty skin. So you can see, um, particularly on the photo on the left, uh, you can see that it's got a very sort of granular skin. Um, so it's very bumpy in its appearance and they have this sort of white stippling down their side. So again, very, very different um, to the way the other two newts look. Um, this sort of wartiness used to be their namesake. Um, until like the mid 90s, they were called the warty newt. Um, and then when they got additional sort of protections by law due to their declines, um, they then got upgraded name wise to great crested newt. So they lucked out a bit um, getting a new name. I think particularly the females because the females never get a great crest. Um, they very much stay a bit more plain and, and warty in their appearance. But yeah, they're a stunning, stunning, stunning animal to see. So again, we'll just look at differences between males and females. It's a lot more obvious um, with the great crested newt. Again, because the males have that lovely big sort of uh, crest that's very jagged. The important thing with its crest there, as you can see, it begins at the, uh, it's the base of its head and it stays very, very tall and very jagged until his back legs, but then it stops. Now, remember the smooth newt, his crest goes the entire length of his body. So if you're seeing a stop, then you know it's a great crested newt, not just the sheer size. The other important thing is again to look at his tail. So his tail almost fans out and he'll get this white stripe that runs through the centre of it. That, I think, is the single most important um, or most useful identification feature for a great crested newt because ponds can be murky. Um, but if you shine a torchlight into a pond in the evening time, when the newt swims up to take a gulp of air and dives straight back down, that white flash will reflect off your light straight away. And you know you've got something very special in that pond. You know it's a great crested newt that you're looking at. So I think it's probably one of the best ID features on the Great Crested Newt, um, particularly in ponds that are less than ideal to look into. Whereas the females, um, they don't get any of that sort of the fancy crest or, or the white stripe. They tend to be, as I said, a little bit larger than the males. Um, they, they lack that crest and they also get sort of a, a yellow line at the base of their tail. So they have a very yellow belly um, and then just one very thin line you'll find right at the base of them. Um, you'll find that throughout throughout their life. Um, so any time of the year, you'll find it will have that yellow line. So if you've lifted up a log um, and you found it's quite a sizable newt. So again, you're looking at the same size as my hand. Quite a big newt under there and has a yellow line at the bottom. Then you know it's a, a great crested newt you found and it's very, very special. Um, one of the other reasons why I say it's very special um, with that with that being so special also comes a bit more responsibility on our behalf. Um, it is a European protected species. Um, which does mean it carries a couple more restrictions than some of our other species we've spoken about. So 
one of the things that that legislation means is it does mean that if you haven't got a license, you shouldn't be handling or disturbing great crested newts. Um, you shouldn't be moving them from one location to another and you've got to be mindful over doing any habitat works or any form of like pond works or clearance in their spaces that they use. Um, it is it is fine um, if you find them. I think it is very special uh, for anyone here that maybe does any form of education outdoors. Again, that's nothing to be worried about. It's very easy to get an education license um, for great crested newts. If let's say you always pond it with children or you always want to go out and have a look in your pond, um, it's very, very easy to show that, you know, you know what you do, you know what you're talking about, you know how to identify them. And basically they'll give you, they'll issue you a license to say, look, we think you're competent. You won't disturb them or their, their lives. Um, and if you dip them up, you'll have a look and put them straight back in. That's all that license is going to say to you. You need a much larger license um, if you were wanting to do work on those ponds or in some crazy cases wanting to remove ponds or anything like that, you definitely need to need to get that checked with someone with a license first. That's the kind of thing you'd go to either us or Natural England about um, to look into for you. Um, I'll add a quick caveat because I know it's very topical at the moment. Um, new counting delays don't exist. Even the full license, um, it will take a council no more than 10 days to get a license to have a look for newts. Um, and then the actual period of doing any form of works with newts uh, can be very short. But the key reason they have that legislation is because they're not doing well um, and they need that. They need that help. But yeah. So we'll go all the way back, just like we did with the frogs and toads, uh, to their first step in their life cycle. So we'll look at the eggs. Um, lots of people, they don't tend to think about what new, new spawn or new eggs look like. Um, so a female newt in both of the species probably would lay about 150 eggs in, uh, in springtime, um, but she lays them one by one and she wraps each egg in an individual leaf. Um, so it's one of the most incredible things to see. Uh, and again, I'm going to urge you to send you straight back to YouTube after this for, for more learning about our species. But there's a, there was a show called Nature's New Wild um, from BBC and they used a GoPro of a great crested newt female laying these eggs and it shows the process where she lays them and then secretes a sort of glue around the egg and then she uses her back feet to hold the leaf in um, closed together to hide the, to hide the egg completely and she'll do this meticulously leaf after leaf. Um, this is even better if you end up in a pond that has loads of newts um, because you'll find you'll look in and you'll think something's gone wrong with your vegetation. All your lovely pond plants have all got 90 degree folds in them where there's been lots of newts laying lots of eggs. There is a reason she does that, of course, by in, sort of enclosing it um, with a sort of a cover around it. She's uh, lessening the chance of it being eaten by any predators. So things like dragonfly larvae and stuff are less likely to come across it or anything else swimming around the pond. And then the second reason, um, which also we'll talk about when I talk about, about surveying later, is actually to protect it from UV. Um, so, of course, when she's laying her spawn, she's laying her spawn in the water. But as the season goes on, plants grow and they'll grow taller and the leaves will shoot up, which may mean you'll sometimes find new eggs above the sort of the surface of the water but by her doing this fold she's stopping any of that sunlight hitting it which is one of the important reasons when we talk a little bit later about doing egg searches as a surveying technique we never expose all of them um, because the minute you bring you expose that out it's about a 95 percent mortality rate of that egg that's unlikely to make it now the minute the minute it's been shown of course if you're doing a survey opening one or two is fine because you need to do it to check what's in there and what you should then be doing beyond that. But you'd normally limit the amount you would touch. But um, yeah, it's a great thing to do. And if you have kids or know any children you need to entertain in springtime, send them out to a pond and make them look for new eggs because uh, yeah, it's a, it can be a tough job. We'll go one more step um, to sort of larvae and, and efts. Um, so they almost look like axolotls at this kind of stage. Um, so the first sort of stage they get, they'll get their back legs and they'll get almost like a big sort of tail, a tail fin um, towards their back and they'll keep these sort of very feathery gills from the way they look. At this life stage, so we're looking at the left at tadpoles, it is very hard to tell the difference between smooth and palmate newts um, at larvae. It's from just an eye, um, it's very, very tough. Of course, DNA sampling would tell you 
um, but likely you're going to just be looking for any adults that are also in that pond. For great crested newts, a bit different. Uh, so great crested newts, not only will their size be basically double the size of the smooth and palmate newt sort of larvae, you'll also see they have all of those lovely sort of black spots along their tail fin. Um, so if they've got all that sort of black mottling, then you know it's a great crested newt larvae you've got and not a smooth or palmate newt. When we move into sort of eft stage, so eft is when they've just left the pond um, or, or leaving the pond. They've got all of their legs. They've still got their feathery gills, um, but they're out on land. Um, again, it's just generally varying size that you're looking for at that point. So it tends to be all of those spots along a sort of kind of present um, tail fin. You'll know it's still great crested and they'll just be a little bit larger. Um, Obviously, the big caveat there is they're not they're not to size um, on this on this uh, slide here. We'll talk a little bit, tiny bit about non-native newts, and then we'll we'll have a break for you guys to ask me any questions about the identification of any of these species or anything about their ecology. Um, but yeah, so the non-natives, most have been released or escaped from pet trade. Again, that law about not being allowed to release. Uh, non-natives into the wild is still relatively new. Quite a lot of populations um, that have got a bit of a stronghold in the UK as non-natives occurred ahead of that coming into play. Um, but still, even to this point, you will find some things are, are released from the pet trade or, or anything like that. I, I myself have been called out once to a, a pond in Camden where someone thought they had great crested newts and actually someone had gone into this public park and, and released axolotls. Um, so you never know what you're going to come across. Um, just as with our second point there, it tends to be in those water bodies anyone can get to. And it does tend to be um, the big cities that we find these in. So the two ones as I mentioned to earlier, uh, the Alpine Newt and the Italian Crested. Um, in London, it tends to be the Alpine Newt that I'm going to find. The Alpine Newt is a really big contender um, in the pet trade, primarily because of its sort of it's very, very vibrant in its colour. They always have a very sort of bold, bright orange belly and it has no spots on it whatsoever. So it's just a plain sort of bright orange, sort of a, almost luminous tummy. Um, they also are sort of a lovely iridescent blue in colour. Um, yeah, and they're about the same. They grow to about the same size as a great crested newt. You would find alpine newts elsewhere in sort of mainland sort of Europe. Um, and it is fine for them to be there. There's, there's plenty of different ponds, there's plenty of different sort of habitats. You will find them in that kind of place. In the UK, they've never been uh, a species on, on this island. Um, there's a few issues with them, uh, particularly in the sort of past 20, 30 years um, with alpine newts in that they're a vector for chytrid. Um, so there's two versions of chytrid. Chytrid BD, which affects the frogs and toads, which we'll talk a bit more about later, and Chytrid B sal, which affects the salamanders and newts. Uh, the alpine newt quite happily can carry and, and have, um, have B sal, Chytrid B sal on their body um, and live with that for their entire life and they're fine with it. But when they move in and out of other ponds with other newt or salamander species, they then spread that and those other species aren't tolerant. Two of the most likely to be hit in the UK with um, B cell is actually the great crested newt first and foremost, and then secondly, the smooth newt. So those are the two main newts that we would find in London are most threatened by uh, chytrid B cell. Uh, this is still quite new um, for us to be aware of in the UK because I think it was two years ago or so a paper came out that they are aware some, some pet alpine newts in the UK have chytrid B cell um, it's very much now about educating people not to release things um, and to be very careful with biosecurity. We will talk again later about biosecurity but just being very mindful that when you're touching any form of water or plants um, in one place you're making sure you're, you're checking and cleaning anything before you head into another. One other issue for the alpine newt um, is the alpine newt can hybridise um, with the great crested newt and one of the issues they have elsewhere in Europe um, with that is they found a real sort of weakening of the great crested newt sort of genetic singularity. So it's it's ending up because it's it's a, it's a non sterile hybrid, so it can continue its life as sort of half alpine, half great crested and then mate with whoever it wishes out of the two. And it's just loosening up uh, the great crested newt from being its own distinct species. 
So it's a, another little worry for us that if they're found, uh, they should be reported straight away um, if, if you spot an alpine newt. That also stands for the Italian crested newt. Um, one word of warning with the Italian crested newt is it looks very similar to the great crested newt. Um, and I would advise if you're not sure, get in touch um, because the last thing you want to do is be well intentioned and pull the wrong newt out of a pond, one which can hold a thousand pound fine for disturbing it and then the other which you know you should be removing. Just just be mindful, mindful of that. But yep, we'll pause now for a break. I'll let Trevor do whatever he needs to do for the chat function and um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll go through them. Hi, Emily. Thanks very much. I sent you full screen now so everyone can see you. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll ask a few questions that have come in. Thank you, everyone, yep. for asking questions. Uh, first question is from Susan. She's very kindly helped move the foxborn from one pond to another. And she's just asking, um, um, how can you tell, do fox and toads have any sort of facial expressions and emotions? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, so, Strictly speaking, it would be a no. They don't necessarily convey any facial expressions, but um, if you've moved them into sort of a pond or a place which they're now on the, the good side of that 0.14% that's going to make it, I imagine they're probably quite happy about given a chance that they're going to do better in, in your new pond than wherever they were initially found. Um, they do have quite smiley faces, I do find. If they come up towards the surface at all, you'll tend to find their, their mouths open quite wide, um, well, primarily because they're consuming whatever they can catch um, within the pond. But yeah, they sometimes look as though they have those sort of larger frog-like faces already as tadpoles. Cool. Um, and then um, a question about, at the beginning, you said newts and salamanders. Um, yeah. Are they the same thing? Good question. Um, so all newts are salamanders, but not all salamanders are newts. The primary difference there is their, sort of the way they live. Um, so newts, like we only have newts in the UK, um, with them and their sort of lifespan, they still spend sort of about 50% of the year in the water, um, whereas salamanders probably spend closer to about 75% of sort of the year in their life on land. Um, so they're slightly more terrestrial based as a salamander strictly. But good question. Oh. Um, and then um, a question that I often get asked when I work with the children, um, male and female, um, between frogs and oh, uh, adding newts as well. Can you tell the difference? Is it just size? Uh, yeah, sometimes size. So the key one is, is size. So the larger they are, more likely it'd be a female. Um, so for both fr common frogs and common toads, a, uh, a female can grow up to about 13 centimetres. Again, that's from her nose down to the, the tip of her, her back, her hind leg. Um, other ways to tell is if you're looking at any time in sort of spring or early summer, um, you're going to look for, if you look at their front arms on both frogs and toads, you'll find the males gain sort of a double thumb. Um, so they'll get these large sort of nuptial pads, which they grow primarily to hold on to the females to mate. So that's a good way of spotting. Um, and there's the third one for the frogs, but you're going to have to have a really good eye to spot this, is on the side of a frog's head. So in that dark eye mask that you spot, you'll see they have that sort of circular eardrum, um, that tympanum there. If that is larger than the size of the eye, it tends to be a male, but yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have to get closer to spot that, Trevor. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I do get up close and personal. <laughs> um, anyhow, sorry. Um, cane toads. Could they live here? Cane toads. That's a good question. Yeah. So cane toads are obviously a problem elsewhere in the world. Um, it's unlikely they would be able to live here. Um, the sort of habitat or the sort of temperature wouldn't really sustain them here. Um, that, that is actually the same way when I was talking about the non-natives we do get. So most of our non-natives are from Europe, um, so have very similar temperatures to us. That is That does still tend to be why they all mate slightly later in the year. Uh, they wouldn't traditionally mate early summer, but it's just because that's the time which our ponds get a bit warmer. So I, I doubt cane toads would, would cope that well with our Oh, that's fairly good, chilly ponds. Um. So they're not good news in other places, are they? Um, no. So um, other questions are, I'll just scan them. Um, are there any specific plants which can be planted to encourage frogs or toads? Yeah, there's quite a lot. Your pond. Um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot I'll um, encourage. I think you said you can see me, right? Um, yeah. There's a guide which I can send to Trevor to send out to all the attendees. Uh, it's called Just Add Water and there's an entire double page spread of plants exclusively that work well for amphibians. Um, and within that, it also gives you an idea of what ones to plant depending on the size of your pond. There's a few stunning plants that no doubt you would have seen in Holland Park's pond, 
but would gladly take over a small garden pond. Um, so I can send that to you, Trevor, and anyone who wants the whole guide, they can have it. Um, yeah, cool. We can definitely do that. And then um, I'll just maybe leave the other questions to later on. I'll just ask you one more. Yeah. Um, someone's asking about um, reintroductions. Uh, so would it be possible to reintroduce great crested ponds to colonise, um, sorry, great crested newts to colonise new ponds? Yep, that does that does happen every so often. Um, one of the key problems with great crested newts and translocations is it has been shown a lot of translocations don't do that well. Um, so a lot of the ponds they have tend to be a lot of the older ponds that are very specific in whatever they, they want. Um, reintroductions can work, but a lot of it is actually down to the habitat. So it may be you move the newts in and they'll be fine there for maybe a season, but you'll find they just won't be breeding. Or worse still, they tend to migrate out of way. Um, there's been, there was quite a large mitigation project. Um, so one of our nature reserves we have in Peterborough called Hampton, um, that came about because there was, there's a very, very large sort of de housing development that went up and there was a few ponds there that had great crested newts. Um, off the back of that, it was a very large site um, that was designated for great crested newts, which we manage. Um, and it was about 40,000 great crested newts moved onto the site. Um, and it's a network of about 200 ponds. But then that was done. Um, with quite a lot of quite a lot of effort and making sure that the ponds are built properly. Um, and then the second element of that was we have, I'm not sure if you've ever heard heard of this before, but there's something called a newt barrier, where it's essentially like concrete posts that are channeled in a, in a sort of slightly strange shape um, that completely encapsulate our entire site. So the newts basically, they, if they try and exit through one of the areas, they get funneled back in towards the middle of the reserve. Um, so it can, it can be done, um, but quite often, when they are moved, not the right amount of work to put into the habitat they're being moved to. OK, cool. Thanks, Emily. So, yeah, um, there's a few more questions we'll ask them at the end, if that's OK. And I think um, some people have asked questions about making a pond for nature. I think that probably that booklet you showed probably would answer some of those questions as well, for like yep. a pond in a school grounds. Cool. I'll send um, back the PowerPoint, Emily, so you can um, crack on, as they say. Okay. Thanks that's a lot. Okay. That's all right. So hopefully we're all back now to me and my screen. Um, so we'll come off the break. So the next bit is for all of you guys uh, to spend a couple of seconds not listening to my voice um, and getting, an, getting a sort of a chance to put whatever you've just learned in that first half of this talk to practice, really. So we'll have a look at eight different images and we're going to give you a few moments with each of them to, to think about what they are. So top left. What animal do you think that is? So what species from all of those that we spoke about do you think that is? And if you are able to, which hopefully you might be able to from what we spoke about, can you tell if that is male or female from what you're looking at? So just have an idea in your head. And then we'll go to the top right. Which species is that in the top right? And again, if you can tell if it's male or female, you can go for it. And then bottom left, what's that that you're looking at? You know what species that is. And then the bottom right, what's that that you're looking at? Again, can you tell what species that is on the bottom? And next slide. So top left, can you tell what that species is? Top right, do we know what that is that we're looking at? Bottom left, which species is this? Or which species does this belong to, shall I say? <laughs> and bottom right, what animal is that? Who is that that you're looking at? OK, so hopefully you've all got an idea about what those each would have been. And I'll go back one slide and we'll just go through them all. Um, I'm not inclined to give points on this, but if you're doing this presentation with someone next to you and you want to turn it into a competition, by all means. Uh, so that top left is a male smooth newt. So the key things we're looking for is that lovely circular spots on his on his belly all the way up through his chin and also that long wavy crest that has no breaks. That's how we know that's a smooth newt. Top right, we're looking at a male palmate newt. So again, no crest there for him. He's got those clubbed back feet that you can see there. He's also got that almost leaf shaped tail that has that tiny filament just out the back. 
bottom left, that's a common frog that we're looking at. We're just cupped in someone's hand. Bottom right, that's common frog tadpoles. So we're looking for that brown coloration with gold speckling. That's how we know it's a common toad. Top one, I love this photo. So top left, this is a male great crested newt. So that warty skin is the first thing we're looking for to know it's a great crested newt with that lovely sort of white stippling. We can tell it's a male for two reasons. We can see that he has that white flash on his tail. And the second reason, it's great because he's out of the water, he has that jagged crest. But you can see it's just flopped over on the top, but you can see that crest still runs down his back and then stops at his back legs. So we know it's a great crested newt. Top right, that is a great crested newt larvae. So you can see, again, it's got that almost axolotl look to it. And you can see it has those sort of uh, black spots along his tail fin. Bottom left, that's a great crested newt egg that we're looking at. So it's that vibrant, bright white coloration that you're looking for there. That would be easier as well if you had the context of the size of that leaf um, and also sort of what pond they were in. Um, and then the bottom right, uh, again, I like to make this joke whenever I can do these sort of online courses because you can't contest it. Everyone's favourite animal, um, the common toad in the bottom right that you can see there. And again, you can see his rough warty skin. You can see that golden eye that we look for. And you can also see those sort of large paratoid glands just behind those eyes. Um, so that's kind of what you're looking for there. Well, for the next sort of half of this presentation, we're going to sort of flick between a few different things. We're going to look at sort of threats, surveying techniques, um, disease and disease control. It very much is an introduction to these kind of topics. Um, if I was to go the whole hog, I think all of you would be, in, it'd still be, would be in bed by the time I'd be finished. Uh, I could talk about this for hours, but we'll go through the threats initially. Um, so a primary sort of big threat to amphibians across all of the world is habitat loss and degradation. Um, the rate of ponds disappearing in the UK alone is insane. Um, to give you sort of an idea, in the sort of past 50 years or so, it's been about a third of the ponds in the UK have disappeared completely. Degradation, um, that happens quite often still regarding ponds can be put in um, but never managed. Every pond's dream is to become a woodland. Um, of course, as succession occurs, they want to take up all those nutrients. The plants want to get bigger and bigger, uh, but to keep ponds or aquatic habitats there, we do need to manage these. Habitat fragmentation and disruption of migration routes. That's a big one. Um, as we start to cut up landscapes, you'll find lots of sort of populations are completely split, split off from each other. Um, nothing can move around. A really good example of that in the UK is actually adder populations. Um, on no single site in the UK is there an adder population larger than 30 individuals um, and they're very much stuck where they are. They can't move around and, and move across places. And the disruption of migration routes as, as a building gets put in place, if an animal's used to doing the same walk every year, particularly female toads, if they hit a barrier that they cannot cross to get back to that pond, many years they'll see it as a failure. They'll just turn around and they'll go back to where they spend their time hibernating and they'll just be terrestrial for the rest of the year. That's one of their problems. Road mortality for those individuals that do end up getting across um, some of that fragmentation, you'll find in that bottom photo there, quite a lot of them get squashed. Disease, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, disease is a massive issue um, globally for amphibians. Amphibians are doing the worst of any group of animals. Um, yeah, globally. Um, they're going through their, their sixth mass extinction right now um, and they're very much the indicator species for if they really start to struggle in places you'll find other animals will then follow sweet. Um, introduction of invasive species, lots of other things being put, put into places that have a detrimental effect of our natives. Pollution, that's quite a big one. Uh, the Lee Valley, actually really close to home for all of us. Um, they had a, an incident where there was a few local businesses dumping oil into the River Lee um, and you found all the first things that came up and had died were all of the amphibians um, and they pretty much showed that that pollution was occurring. And climate change, although that's obviously a large issue, what we are finding is our amphibians aren't having the correct cycle of hibernation and coming out on time. Lots of mild winters are causing, are basically causing um, 
them to either come out of hibernation too early or not having full periods where they should be laying dormant. Um, we expect every so often there to be a weather issue or an anomaly like the beast from the east a few years ago. That's fine if that happens every so often. You end up with loads that rush to the pond, all the spawns being laid, the temperature plummets, ponds freeze over. You get a large quantity of winter kill occur, which is when you get large quantities of them die because of the pond getting uh, getting too cold. Um, you'll expect that every so often, but if that continues occurring, that's then going to have a massive knock on populations. Um, I will touch very briefly on licensing. I know it's not not always the most thrilling of topics um, to look at legislation, um, but this is just a, a slight overview of what what um, what our species are covered by in the UK. So the biggest one is the Wildlife and Countryside Act, but that's what pr prohibits people taking um, wildlife from from the wild um, and sort of selling it on or keeping it as captive. Um, there's many other different versions here. They they cover our species generally in conjunction with each other. Some of them actually tend to only come into play when when a sort of crime or a problem's already occurred. Um, so like the Animal Scientific Procedures Act would actually only really be put into consideration if tail or toe clippings occurred. But there's a whole host of different things. Um, in addition to these, I touched upon it earlier about the Great Crested Newts. They get their own little slide because they're covered slightly more or slightly closer than some of our others. Um, their other one is their European protected species status, um, which just basically covers them and their habitats. Um, I like to think as well, this legislation isn't just great for them as a species group. It's so important for all the other animals that use their habitats. Um, otherwise, a sort of terrestrial bit of land next to a set of ponds could easily be developed upon. Um, and you may get a whole host of different sort of rare or unique plants. There are other animals that use that space that otherwise wouldn't have any protection. So I do think some of our protected species have a, have a great job in looking after other, other wildlife that we have. So we'll, I'm going to briefly touch upon surveying methods because generally we do a very large course that looks into surveying. But I'll go through the main the main groupings of them and, and what we would do um, when going into survey for any of our sort of species and the timings really. So just having a look down here on the methods table, we're generally doing from March to May is when we'd look to be doing egg searching. Of course that makes sense um, because that's when we'd expect to find eggs um, within the sort of ponds. And that's a very easy thing to go around and do. So you're just walking around the pond edge, you're checking every few metres or so, um, checking the leaves, seeing if there's any folds. If they are, you're, you're opening up leaves to check if it's new eggs essentially, um, to see what you're exposing and seeing what's happening. Um, of course, egg searches are a lot more apparent for frogs. Um, I don't think they even classify as under a surveying technique because you're going to notice frogs born when it appears. Um, and that's something that's absolutely fine. The reason why the license required list along the right hand side is just in there because that's if it was great crested newts. So just to give you an idea if any of the ponds you guys are visiting or, or want to do any surveying on, these are the ones that great crested newts would need. You'd need slightly more license. You'd need a license essentially to do it. Uh, dip netting. Um, so this is this is pond dipping essentially. Um, you can do this for a lot longer a period in the year. Um, you're just going out. And again, we do it at two meter intervals um, and you'd be dipping through the pond to see what you're finding. It's not the greatest because, of course, what can occur is you could dip all day long, not get a single newt and then maybe come back in the evening and then they're all in there where they've all just evaded your capture, which is possible. Um, so it is a little bit unreliable of that. The disruption uh, is also not great. You'll be tend to be disturbing a lot of the silt in the sort of pond base and lots of other species in there. Um, you also will catch other things that are not your intention of catching um, in your actual dipping. But it's certainly a very useful thing to see hands on what's there. The terrestrial refuge searching, uh, that's almost like bug hunting that you do with children. So you're pretty much going to go out and you're going to be checking under places um, that you feel that those animals would be during their hibernation period. So under log piles, um, under any form of rotting vegetation is the kind of place that you're looking for. Uh, it's unreliable because again you could you could lift up 30 logs and find nothing but then the three you didn't lift up uh, could have all your nukes on site but a lot of these techniques you'd use in conjunction with each other a further set um torching so 
we're still just at the tail end of our torching sort of season or, or time period. Um, it's when you go out in the evening, so you're going out after basically sundown um, and you'll go out with your torch and you'll pan around that pond, shining the light in to see if there are any uh, newts or amphibians about in that sort of space um, to give you an idea if there's presence or absence in them. Of course, the disadvantage there um, is if it's an incredibly vegetated pond or the edges are very vegetated, you're not going to see much. And if it's quite turbid or very sort of muddy, essentially, um, you're not going to be able to spot it. The other big thing there is um, that's very dependent on weather. Um, so if it's raining, you're going to find it really tough because when you're looking at the pond surface, there's going to be too much movement for you, be able to, for you to be able to see below. Um, also, um, if it's very windy, you're going to have the same issue. Um, the pond surface is going to be moving too much for, for you to be able to see very clearly um, what is under there. The next, uh, the next two are ones that you definitely need a license for. Um, I would also say only do this with whoever your site representative is that's, that's in charge of ecology on your site or anything like that that you're looking at, um, just because these two have quite a high risk of potentially harming an animal. Um, so bottle trapping um, is a great technique that we do use often to survey, well, mainly for newts. Um, which is essentially when you're putting bottles in intervals around a pond edge, um, you're basically inverting them. So there's a very, very large sort of opening that they get funneled through and then you generally can't get back out. Um, one of the key reasons that we'd always say to try and do that only if you've got a license or someone that really knows what they're doing is because when these animals go in, you're going to only want to be setting these traps probably around midnight. Um, and as a charity, or as a charity that specialises in amphibians, um, we would say no longer than seven hours those traps should be out. So you're going to have to be getting back up at the crack of dawn to go out and pull the traps out, um, primarily because anything you're putting in that little space um, is going to be trapped for that period of time. So if it got very, very warm or there became any direct sunlight on that bottle trap, you're essentially going to cook up anything that's in there. And also, if you've got any other species, that have swum in that cannot cope with being stuck in a small space for a small period of time um, is something you need to be mindful of. Pitfall trapping is the exact same. Um, it can be very effective because essentially anything that's walking in a certain direction towards a pond, it will fall in. You've just got to be mindful with this as well because of the level of mortality that occurs. If you're trapping something in there, particularly other species, maybe like dormice that might end up falling in and can't get out, um, or worse still, um, in urban areas, it's not something we really do in any of our sites in London, pitfall trapping, because we have so many sort of domestic pets that are out and about, like cats. Um, it's very easy for a cat to go out, enter a pitfall trap, consume or kill everything in there um, where those animals can't get away. And then when you turn up, you're essentially going to turn up and go, well, there's nothing in there, where actually maybe you have caught quite a large amount of animals, but they've all been predated on. But yeah, there's, there's quite a wide, wide range of techniques that we would use. And um, we generally use lots of these in conjunction with each other. Um, but we would, on average, we'd say four to six visits a year for a site. So during this whole period of time, generally from spring through summer, we'd say four to six visits to get a good idea of whether sort of your population size. Um, one or two will show you if they're present or absent. That's if, that's if you really want to go down the, uh, the surveying route for our, our species. Um, and we do have plenty of courses that cover exclusively surveying and we go out and do it. Um, if you're interested, just get in touch. Um, this slide comes in because if any of you are taking this time to eat, the next slide isn't very pleasant to look at. It's lots of images of ill amphibians, just in case you don't want to see that. I. Uh, I've done this many a time where I've flicked straight onto this and people have gone, oh, I wasn't prepared for that. So here's your warning. Um, we'll have a little look at some of the diseases. So just going from the top left down. Um, so the, uh, the top left up here, that sort of shedding skin is, is one of the symptoms of chytrid. Um, that's chytrid BD, which affects the frogs and toads. It's basically an increased shedding over the skin. Um, and also tends to culminate in almost like a white fluff across their skin. Now, as an amphibian, amphibians do tend to breathe with their skin, uh, through their skin. So again, you're going to start to suffocate that animal um, alongside that. 
the only slight thing when it comes to chytrid is chytrid um, can be present in frogs or toads, um, but it doesn't show up like this. There can be a wide range of things, so it might just be they're looking very, very sluggish. They're not eating. You might only see slight discoloration on one part of their body. You might find that they're really emaciated. Um, in those scenarios, it's still worth getting in touch with us or Garden Wildlife Health to check them out. Um, they don't all present just like that individual in the top left. Um, but yeah, chytrid BD is a big problem. Um, it's the reason for just over 90 species of amphibian um, going extinct. And this is just in the past 30 years. Um, it's also the reason for a decline in, I think the last count was about 500 species globally. Um, and it is something that unfortunately is present in the UK. So we are lucky in one way, and although today has been a really poor example for this, um, generally the UK isn't warm enough for chytrid BD to thrive. Chytrid BD likes 24 degrees Celsius for a consistent period of time. Um, it likes that, that temperature or higher. It's when the, when the fungal infection basically will continue to reproduce and spread across a whole population. What we do see occur is chytrid will be dormant in individuals for a while, and then there'll be a period, maybe a really hot summer, where we'll get small groups of populations die off, um, but then it will go back to normal because we're not hot enough to sustain it. It is a worry, of course, that if we continue to get long periods of, of hot weather, it may be a disease we see more prevalent. I will go down towards this bottom left where you see these two, um, these two sort of salamanders. Um, so those salamanders there have chytrid B cell. Um, so it's the other version or the other variant of chytrid. Um, you can see there what you kind of see in, again, is that sort of blotchiness on the skin. And these ones also have almost sort of like sores on their, um, on their sort of skin as well. Um, chytrid B cell, as I said, can be carried by alpine newts. Um, is a bit of a bigger worry for us. Again, I said we know we have it in some captive populations in the UK. It's a particular worry because alpine newts that were found across the northern parts of the Netherlands had spread B cell across a whole network of ponds and actually led to basically fire salamanders in northern parts of the Netherlands had declined by 99.9% .9 population size in a period of a few years. And one of the reasons why that really took hold is chytrid B cell thrives at 18 degrees and higher. Um, now, just like the Netherlands, we do tend to sit at that temperature more often. Um, so that could be the chytrid fungus that will affect our, our populations of newts a lot stronger. Um, so that's something really to keep an eye out for. If you do spot it, please do get in touch. Um, it's one of our sort of worries at the moment that we're, that we're monitoring. We'll go to the top middle photo. And so you'll see there's sort of four separate images there, all looking at sort of blotchy skin. That there is ranavirus. So I did speak about ranavirus earlier and said we also call it red leg. Um, so you can see there, even though we call it red leg, it is very obvious sort of sores or ulcers on their skin. Uh, it also tends to be paired with, they will be very lethargic. And um, there'll be lots of other symptoms showing. They may not be doing the behaviors they should be doing. You may find in a sunny day that that frog it's just going to be sitting out in the sun or not moving away from predators or being somewhere that would just be really silly uh, when you're a prey, ad prey animal to be in that kind of place. Uh, again, something you should you should report if you spot it out and about. Uh, we do get spikes of ranavirus in the UK every so often. Um, the last spike was actually last year um, and that was in London. So just be mindful it can occur. The top right, um, sort of just underneath our logo there, uh, that's a dermocystid, a dermocystid infection. So that's kind of, a, it's a parasite essentially. Uh, and you'll see there's all those sort of like little lesions or bumps on the skin. Um, sometimes these sort of parasites will get into new populations. They, they tend to, if it's a small amount of these parasites, um, the newts can sometimes function fine. You'll find though in some situations, you, you may find there'll be newts completely covered in the bumps. Um, and then eventually that will lead to sort of an earlier death of those newts. But again, if you ever see newts with those bumps or lumps, um, or just generally the theme of this is if you see anything looking a bit odd and not as it should be, get in touch um, about it or with Garden Wildlife Health. Um, but that's another thing we do sometimes spot. And then the bottom, the bottom image there. Um, so the male frog on top, 
he has something called uh, ranid herpavirus. So it's essentially sort of um, frog herpes. Um, it culminates in these kind of, we call them candle wax lesions. So it almost looks like candle wax has dripped over their skin. They tend to be quite blue in colour. Um, that does occur. You do find that. You tend to see that spike around mating time. Um, so earlier on in the, in the year, um, you'll see that a bit more. Um, it, they will generally function fine for a while, but then eventually it will, it will lead to a quicker sort of exhaustion rate and more likely to die from that post mating. Um, and they can spread it throughout the population. So just be mindful. Um, the other thing I should just add on this slide is if you found a, a dead or diseased frog or a frog that looks like it was diseased before it had died, and it's sort of in an area where lots of your other healthy frogs are, um, whilst you're getting in touch with us, it's a good idea just to isolate that. So just move it out the way, um, just to potentially not allow that dormant sort of fungus or whatever it is on the skin of that, that dead individual to be able to spread further. Um, but yeah. Um, I'm now going to move away from this, this horrid looking slide. Um, I won't go through and read all of this out to you. Um, you can find plenty of information about how to control disease um, for amphibians. But just the key things always is just um, you don't need to handle amphibians um, all of the time. If, if you're sure that you don't need to touch them and you can just have a look or take a vote of them, then by all means do that. Um, you don't want to be touching things and then touching another individual and potentially spreading whatever that is within. Um, other key things are it's not necessarily a problem if you've only got one site or only one pond you look after. But if you are using sort of any surveying equipment or if you're using sort of pond dipping nets, if you're using them from one pond to another, that's something to be very mindful of that if it's got a disease or something on that that you've now got on your net and you've just plunged it into a different pond, you potentially have moved that disease across. That goes all the way through to things like your boots. Um, so someone like me could put a lot of amphibians at risk because I visit many different ponds all across London. So it's very important that we do keep on top um, and use the sort of government's check clean dry procedure, which is you're checking your boots to make sure there's no obvious sort of detritus on them. Um, and then you're going to clean them off with sort of disinfectant or anything like that, so something like Vercon or, or a bleach mix, and then dry them off and then go back onto a site. And then the last point about amphibians not being moved between sites. Um, this comes up a lot at the beginning of each year, just because, of course, people are very well intentioned moving frog spawn. Um, my best rule of thumb for that is always if that frog has made a really poor choice, let's say you've got a lovely garden pond um, in your back garden and you've gone out onto your driveway and there's a frog in this puddle and it's laid all of its spawn, by all means move that spawn to the, your back garden. That's absolutely fine. Um, a female frog, wherever she lays her spawn or wherever she is, she's likely to be using or visiting ponds within sort of a, a 200 metre radius. So if you are moving spawn within that 200 metres, you are unlikely to be spreading a disease that she herself wouldn't have spread by herself. Um, when you start moving it further away than that, that's when you're going to run into the risk of you could be spreading a disease around or further than um, where that frog ever would have come from. So, so please do be mindful um, regarding that. Um, I've seen other people, they'll hand rear them. Um, so they'll, if they found it in a really, really silly place, but there isn't somewhere suitable nearby, they've, they've gone home, had their tad grown, they've grown their tadpoles all the way up to froglets um, and then released them back at that pond. That kind of thing can be fine. Um, just of course, be mindful over whoever owns that land or that pond. Um, I'm sure no sort of, land uh, owner or land management would be happy if you just to uh, nip into their pond and nick their spawn, grow it up and then return it. Um, so please, if you if you want to do that, get permission from whoever owns that that pond or that that site. Um, but yeah, just be mindful of um, because, of course, if it's from your neighbour, that's absolutely fine because you, you're so close anyway. But when you go further afield, you don't want to be the reason um, to spread the disease further. Oh, this is this is just a side point, essentially explaining that sort of uh, disinfectant and, and how we would do that. Um, it's just looking again at disease control. This is something if any of you are really keen or you do go out and visit loads of ponds, um, I can send this kind of information out. It's not at all a problem. Um, you can get in touch with me directly and I can just send you loads of fact sheets about it. Um, the only other point when it comes to disease, um, it's generally an issue when it comes to uh, non-native plants. But uh, when we think about dogs, and dog walkers, when you take dogs out to run around, um, if ponds, particularly new ponds, 
if they've just been built, they tend to have a fence around them. And there may be very clear signs to say, don't allow dogs into that area. Um, please do adhere to those signs. There's, there's generally one of two reasons. Um, it can either be the pond has deliberately been isolated because it has something in there that it does, that the site doesn't want to spread. So it could be a really nasty sort of a type of weed they don't want spread around. And obviously your dog will run in loving life, uh, get it all over their paws and then run into another pond further down that hasn't got a fence around it. And potentially that's now spread it or vice versa. It could be a brand new pond and they want to keep it isolated so it can grow to be a bit more mature before sort of a, an invasive gets in. And that also counts for the chytrid funguses. Uh, chytrid B cell can live for two weeks off of an amphibian. So it can live on a on a dead leaf for two weeks quite happily um, without becoming active again in another pond. So last thing you want to do is run in, dog gets it all over their paws and then runs into another pond and now they've spread chytrid. So just to be mindful of, if you're seeing those kind of signs, um, please, please do respect them. I think we're we're now there. I think you're now done. We're listening to me, and you're you're free to ask me any questions, any questions that you that you wish. Emily, thanks so much um, for your time and your talk. It's really interesting. Lots of cool facts as always. Um, there's a one last question that someone wrote, which links into um, I was thinking it uh, more pesticides as well, but they're talking about hedgehogs and other mammals can be infected with lug worm, sorry, lung worm by yes. eating slugs and snails. Is this the case with frogs and toes? And, and then I was thinking, you know, like pesticides going up the food chain as well. Does that affect them in the same way? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, long worm generally doesn't um, affect our amphibians. Um, pesticides does. Um, so the exact same as something like a, a hedgehog consuming a slug that's had a bunch of sort of metaldehyde slug pellets and then they've now got that in their body. That can happen with amphibians and it is quite detrimental to their populations. Um, so yeah, definitely non-organic, um, well, to be fair, no, no pesticides really are needed. Uh, all you need is a, a stronger population of amphibians or small mammals and they'll they'll do the job for you. Um, cool. And I, I just wrote an announcement saying that if anyone's got a question after this talk, that I can email it to you and you can obviously yeah. help. And I see your, your contact details up on the slide. So I think it just remains for me to give you a, a thanks again for your time and all your hard work. And we'll see you in a few weeks time for common lizards on the 3rd of September, yeah. Yeah, which will be good. And then we've got another one on the 20th about plants with Dr. Mark Spencer. So thanks everyone for joining us. Have a good evening. Cheerio.